Hello everybody, um, I'm Becky Devlin, I'm a Qualification Manager in the Open University's Faculty of Business and Law. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to the seminar in which um, Laura, Dr Laura McGrath will present on psychology and the origins of gender identity. <clears throat> um, before we actually start um, Laura's presentation. I am going to mention two things just to kind of promote our gender critical research network. We we have a YouTube channel, which is where this video of this seminar will be appearing. Um, it's YouTube. The, the address to find it is youtube.com slash at O-U-G-C-R-N. Um, or you can search on YouTube for Open University Gender Critical Research Network, and that should find our channel. And Previous seminars, videos from lots of those are available there. So if you've missed any, you can catch up. Um, and we also, if you use that same search term, Open University Gender Critical Research Network, um, you should be able to find our website, which kind of has lots of other details about the network and who's involved and the types of things that we do. So, right, without further, further ado, I'm going to hand over to Laura. So over to you. Thanks, Becky. I'm just going to share my presentation. Stay with me. I might have muted you accidentally. Can you? Are you able to unmute? Right. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. Perfect. Great. So can everyone see my slides? Yep, slides are up. Great. Um, OK, so um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Laura McGrath. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology here at the Open University. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about this is a paper that I've written that's somewhere in the re review process at the moment. Um, and this came about really from some empirical work that I did um, looking at experiences of people using gender medicine. But I think the more fundamental kind of um, uh, motivation behind this paper is just me trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And that, sorry, by that, of course, I'm referring to the gender wars. So this is this um, very peculiar political conflict that we found ourselves in. Um, which is uh, fundamentally uh, an argument about whether we should replace sex, whether or not somebody is male or female, their so reproductive capacity, with the idea of gender identity, so meaning how masculine or feminine or other somebody feels themselves to be. So that sounds like a relatively abstract kind of conflict, but of course it's got a whole load of extremely practical and real consequences. So it's changes where which kind of prisons people go to um, or other kinds of single sex spaces like domestic violence shelters, uh, hospital wards, psychiatric wards. Um, it affects the kinds of data that we can collect and kind of how people are described in formal data and, and in research. And it affects what kind of sports people can take part in. So it has all of these. It's been a um, very a uh, vicious political conflict in the UK really um, visible since about 2018, but it's been going on for a lot longer before that as well. So today I'm not going to talk about all of all of that, but I am going to talk about this concept of gender, which is, you know, apparently what we're all warring over. Um, and think a bit about where gender has come from and why maybe it's become something that's so central to our politics um, and why some of the reasons why that might be. So at stake in the gender wars, there are at least three different meanings of the term. So one is the kind of feminist idea that gender is a social system which oppresses women. So uh, this is the idea that gender is a word for the kind of cultural and social um, attributes which men and women are supposed to have in a patriarchal idea of sex. Um, also at stake is this idea that gender is an identity, so this is an internal uh, characteristic of somebody, which we all have, we're all supposed to have a gender identity, and also that we can all kind of find out our gender identity by, um, by reflection and thinking about it ourselves. 
And this is also very much the main conflict that I first came across in the gender wars was between these two ideas, really. Um, one thing that's interesting about this is that both of these groups are claiming gender as a kind of grounds for liberation. So in feminism, the grounds for liberation is that we can identify gender as the things that we need to get rid of. So the kind of social, culturally constructed aspects um, which go along with um, kind of expectations for the sexes, so gender is something we need to get rid of. And in genderism, um, so that's, I've adopted Laura Favaro's term for kind of a politics that takes gender identity as needing to um, overtake sex as a concept. So in, in genderism, liberation comes from having more and more gender. So we need to all have, um, be able to express gender identities, have those validated by others. And both of these groups also accuse the other one of being of really doing patriarchy, which is the kind of other idea of gender that people are in dialogue with. So um, this is the idea that you know men are just naturally masculine, women are just naturally feminine, um, men just happen to be suited to all the things to do with power, and women just really, really like cleaning naturally. Sorry, all the ladies. So this idea also turns up in the gender wars quite a lot. So you can see it in the kind of conservative response to genderism, to the idea of gender identity becoming more prevalent in this kind of, there's only two genders, there's only, you know, everybody just needs to stop messing about and get back into their, their proper roles. So this, um, so in, in kind of summary, really, the gender Versions of gender and gender wars are kind of, there's only two boxes. We need lots and lots and lots and lots of new boxes, and we need to get rid of the boxes. Those are the kind of the, the positions. So when I first came across this conflict, my um, idea of gender was probably the top one. And also, I assumed that that was the older meaning of gender. So that the feminist, um, that gender was a kind of feminist concept that had come along. And then these, these other ideas of gender, gender identity in particular, was kind of newer and had taken it over. And you see that a lot in the kind of generational discourse that you get around the gender wars, that they're kind of, you know, this is the new idea that we're just behind the time. So, um, but actually, um, it turns out that's not true, that gender didn't start off as a feminist concept at all. Um, it's, and gender identity is actually an older concept than the idea of gender that was adopted in the feminist second wave, as a, or at least the word gender that was adopted in the feminist second wave. Um, so where gender actually came from originally, uh, it may have spoiled this by the title of the talk, was actually from psychology. So first of all, um, so here, when I'm using the term gender is where this came from, what I mean is gender used as a distinct concept from sex. So before the kind of mid 20th century, uh, in English, gender and sex were largely synonyms. So um, gender was very rarely used to talk to mean sex, it's mainly a linguistic term. <clears throat> but sex was also used to talk about both the biology um, of being male or female, but also the social condition of men and women as well. So it was used for what we would now often call gender. And then this started to change in um, the kind of 1940s. This is from Madison Bentley, who was a developmental psychologist, um, talking really about the, um, talking about the process of a child coming to see themselves as a boy or a girl. So coming to understand really that they are a boy or a girl and what the expectations are which go along with that. So you can see here that here gender is basically a process of socialization. So he calls it the socialized of the sex. Um, it's something that's done to children, which they then kind of internalize and start to view themselves as either being a boy or a girl. This was uh, followed, sorry, being a bit sticky, um, in the 1950s by the far more influential version of gender, which came from John Money. And this is the idea of gender role that he uh, developed in the 1950s, which he called says is all those things that a person says or does to disclose to himself or herself 
as having the status of a boy or a man, a girl or a woman, respectively. So it includes, but is not restricted to, eroticism in the sense of sexuality. If that's not clear, because money was not the clearest of writers, he means their sexual orientation. So part of being a man, having the status of a man, is fancying women. Part of having the status of a woman is fancying uh, men, according to John Money. So you can see here that um, what he did, what Money did, was take this kind of idea of a socialising process, something that's done to people, done to all people, and turned it into an individual characteristic. So gender role is something that people have individually as a person. This was further developed in the 60s by uh, Robert Stoller. So uh, John Money was a psychologist. He was a psychologist working in medicine, and Robert Stoller was a psychiatrist. And he um, brought in this term gender identity, which is more familiar today than gender role. So Robert Stoller was in conversation with Money. He um, was writing directly about Money's ideas, whereas that neither of them really mention the kind of earlier developmental use of gender. Um, and he was arguing with Money um, because Money's idea was that while gender role was this kind of internal characteristic of a person, it started out externally. So he thought that if you raise a child before the age of 18 months as either a boy or a girl, then they would have a fixed male or female gender role. Um, and, and Stoller came along and said, well, I don't think it's that simple. I think that actually some people have this kind of internal drive to masculinity and femininity um, or femininity. And so these two kind of combine their ideas and form the, the kind of more modern concept of gender identity. Um, so you can see here that there's been a process from an external socialising um, general process to an internal characteristic that's a kind of internal drive that we all have and that is more familiar. And the reason why the two, so Money and Stoller, have, have proved so influential is because they then went on to found the earliest gender clinics. So John Money in the 1960s um, founded the first gender clinic at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore with um, Harry Benjamin, who was a writer who really popularized the term transsexual and kind of did a lot for um, mainstreaming the, that idea, um, the, the identity of transsexual. Um, and Stoller worked at UCLH in California, which again was a very early gender clinic. So these ideas they had here that this gender role is this kind of internal characteristic of a person have proved very foundational to gender medicine. And also then from there was, were adopted into feminism and queer theory. And that's where we kind of, that's the lineage of where the ideas of gender we have today. But what's really interesting, I think, is that John Money's ideas, gender role and gender identity, didn't actually come from gender medicine. They weren't a response to the problems addressed in gender medicine, if you want to see them as problems, um, because those clinics didn't exist at this time. So John Money was actually dealing with a very, well, with a different um, population and a different set of clinical and medical issues. And I think it's really important important to look at why he created gender role and what uh, the function of the concept was in his clinical practice to then understand um, what, how, how that has then gone on to be used in, in, in different contexts after this. Because um, John Money was working not in gender medicine because that didn't exist, he wasn't working with women, he wasn't working with trans people, he wasn't working with any of the kind of groups that we think of today as being involved in the gender wars, really. Um, he was working in DSD medicine. Um, so DSD are differences of sex development. Um, I'd just like to say before I talk about the section that I'm not a biologist, as you may, may well be able to tell. But um, very broadly, differences of sex development are a set of conditions as many which have where people have some kind of atypicality of sex development. So differentiation of sex development starts quite early in utero, so about four weeks, I think, 
Um, and it's driven by our, the kind of typical development process is driven by chromosomes and hormones. So, you know, if you have XX or XY chromosomes, then the fetus is kind of this kind of instruction to go down the male or female pathway. And then that instruction, if you like, is kind of carried out by by the hormones and enzymes that um, that actually um, form the fetus in in um, in development. So any differences in chromosomes, sex chromosomes, and sex hormones is going to lead to a difference in in development of sex characteristics uh, to a non typical kind of set of sex characteristics. None of this means, as I'd say, if anyone has to go at me, none of this means that we don't have um, two sexes in human beings, but there are a set of conditions where people have non-typical sex development. So a um, an example of this, which was really foundational in Money's work, is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So um, the adrenal gland um, mod mod modulates um, hormone production and release in the body. So this is a, a, a a condition which is causes problems with the adrenal gland, so it causes problems with all sorts of hormones. But most um, relevant here is that in both um, men and women, uh, CAH causes excess androgens, so testosterone. And this is um, really important for sex development because testosterone is the main hormone really that masculinizes development, so that that pushes a, a development of the fetus down the kind of male pathway. So um, when female um, fetus has excess androgen, this can mean that there are some, so some of the development can develop a bit down the male pathway, it can be masculinized to some extent. So one example is in development, the clitoris, um, in female development, um, the clitoris and the penis come from the same kind of base material. So one of the things that can happen if you have an excess amount of androgens and you're female, then you can develop a kind of large clitoris, small penis. And um, there's also other effects on hair and voice and some fertility problems. But I would point out it's important that um, women with CAH can often still have children. So Money was working in, clin in a clinic with people with these conditions, many of them babies, children. So DSD are often noted at birth, but also they can often become apparent at puberty as well when people just kind of have an unexpected puberty. And Money's overriding clinical question, which led him to write these papers about gender role and which which he was trying to what he was trying to promote by um, by developing gender role, was which sex should clinicians working with DSD choose for their patients? And it really was that paternalistic at this time. So you're faced with people um, who have atypical kind of set of sex characteristics, but really we're trying to pick whether they should be in the male or the female category. And what had been, um, what had been the norm um, was that this was done by gonads. So basically, if somebody has ovaries, they're female. If somebody has testes, and sperm, they're, they're male. And that makes sense because sex is, after all, our reproductive capacity, and those are the, you know, the eggs that we use to reproduce. So that had been the, um, that been the standard. And money's um, reason for introducing gender role was to say, no, we shouldn't be looking at gonads. Um, we should instead be using people's gender role, meaning, as I just described, their sense of how whether or not they feel that they're a man or a woman. And we shouldn't be so tied to their reproductive capacity. And this was his um, reasoning for this. So this is um, Money talking about um, a case of a girl born with CAH, um, as I just described, uh, who, and so I it's quite common because um, babies with CAH, girls with CAH, can be born with this small, large clitoris, small penis um, genitalia that are mistaken for boys at birth, and then it becomes apparent at puberty um, with development of sex characteristics, secondary sex characteristics, and perhaps certain periods that actually the child is female. So the standard had been that um, we should take um, that the clinicians would tell the parents and the child that, sorry, there was a mistake, you're a girl, 
and change their kind of name and on all of that. But money said no, this would be an error because a boy changed to wear dresses once ovaries were discovered may continue to think, act and dream as the boy he was brought up to be, eventually falling in love with a boy, only to be considered homosexual and maladjusted by society. Alternatively, after the change, the gender role may be partly modified, but only at the cost of psychologic disorder, sufficiently disabling to prevent marriage. In either case, the plan to preserve fertile gonads carries the seeds of its own defeat by ensuring that fertility never culminates in reproduction. So what money is saying here is that the problem is if, if a child has been brought up to be a boy, they'll have a male gender role, as he would have seen it. So therefore, if you tell them that they're a girl, then they'll just continue to be really masculine. So they might fancy women instead of men, only to be, you know, apparently that's a terrible thing. And or they might be just a masculine woman, heterosexual woman. That's what he means by gender or partly modified. And if you're a masculine woman, apparently the only two outcomes are uh, madness and um, live and dying alone, according to money. So in any case, this this girl, masculine girl, apparently is is never going to have children anyway. So it doesn't matter if we um, about preserving a fertility. So it's a little bit hard to tell from the papers that Money wrote exactly what their intervention was in this case that he's talking about. But I think, uh, reading between the lines, I think what they did was remove uh, ovaries and I think probably the womb as well in this um, tile. And then I think also probably give testosterone to kind of boost the masculinization of, of of puberty. So some of these interventions may sound familiar from later gender medicine, but it's in this, this context. Um, and um, Money was uh, saying that we should take the gender role, masculinity, male gender role, and change the body to fit the gender role, rather than take the body of, sort of realizing that this girl has ovaries and is a girl, and, you know, adapt the society to maybe, you know, think that it's okay for girls to be masculine or to uh, be lesbians. So that wasn't an option. Instead, he's saying we need to take this masculine child and make their body male so that nobody, so that they can live in a, in a happy way. So he talks about this later. Um, so he's saying uh, after all of these interventions, then this, this girl grew up to be universally accepted by his professional peers as a man, by his wife as a husband, by his adopted children as a father, not notably different from other fathers in the community. Absolutely no one ever thought of them as being a lesbian or even bisexual. So what he's advocating for is taking, um, is these, is basically changing people who have got a DSD to make it so it's very socially invisible that, that that has ever been the case, that they have any sort of difference. Um, Alice Drager called Money's approach the concealment approach to DSD, saying that he was trying to make DSD disappear socially. So all of the kind of interventions are aimed at making, at kind of putting people very securely into one or the other sex category. And what he was doing with gender role was saying, this is the, the terms on which we should make that decision. We should just pick how masculine or feminine somebody feels themselves to be. So as obviously there's a huge amount that we can say about this. Um, and um, I'm sure that we will at some point. But what I um, want to think about is, it's also interesting that this, they came up with this, this concept, but this is a very, you know, a relatively obscure part of medicine that money was was working in. And yet, you know, 10 years later, he went on to found gender, a whole set of gender clinics where they were looking at gender role in lots of other different people. And then, you know, whatever it is now, 70 years later, we're having major political debates over this idea of gender. So why did it catch on to this extent? What is it that money was doing with this concept that, 
has turned out to be so influential. Um, and I think, um, okay, fine. Um, so I think that we can start to understand this if we look at it in relation to um, what money did in relation to the kind of existing ideas of sex. So the kind of patriarchal Western system of sex. I'm just going to very quickly, hopefully, go through um, what are the kind, what's the kind of Western patriarchal model. So this is the idea that there are two types of people, male and female, men and women, and there is a very hard boundary between the two of them. So and male people are in charge and um, women exist to kind of serve, serve, serve men. So this is based on many decades of feminist um, analysis. So uh, attributed to men in this system are attributes like mind, reason, culture, activity, subjectivity. Attributed to women are things like body, emotion, nature, passivity, and being a, an object. And there's a very hard line between these two things. And the reason there's a hard line is you may notice that all of these male attributes are those which we associate with, with kind of humanity, and all of the female attributes are those which are in a kind of absence of humanity or a less, less of humanity, lesser humanity. And this um, is an accidental. So um, this is because if you have groups, if you have a group of people who is oppressing another group of people or exploiting another group of people, it's much easier to do that if you view those other people as less human than you are. So you don't just see this kind of um, construction with, with sex and with men and women, but also with other oppressed groups, like in terms of hierarchical ideas about race or hierarchical ideas about, sex, about class. So um, it's very important in the patriarchal model to maintain this, this line between the two sexes, to maintain the kind of separation. Because if you are maintaining the idea that you are the only real humans, then you have to push everything else out into the other category. So, and if we break this down a little bit more, I see that this relies on a hard separation, not just between men and women in terms of having different bodies, um, but also men and women have to have different types of minds and different types of socio-political roles as well. So there's a kind of, um, this kind of obscures lots of levels of things which need to be held apart in order to sustain the kind of patriarchal model of sex. So, so what was money? What did money's concept do in relation to this this wider patriarchal model, this underlying patriarchal model that's been around for so long? So, one of the ways that we can think about what what money was coming across in his clinic was that it wasn't very easy to um, actually separate male and female. That doesn't mean that sex doesn't exist, but what it does mean is that case by case, he was finding it difficult to place people securely in one or the other category. And you can see this in the language that he uses all the way through those early papers about gender role, where he talks about DSD as um, being incongruous, as, as being incongruities, as contradictory, or as a paradox. Now, of course, nobody can be contradictory to themselves. We're all just people with bodies, so we're not a contradiction or a paradox. So these words are all talking about how he viewed DSD people as relating to the sex category because they were not easy to place. And in fact, in, he also talks about a major driver for creating gender roles was that they'd actually got better at sex testing in the kind of decades before money was, was writing. So for instance, they'd invented um, uh, chromosome testing. So that meant that there were more and more cases of DSD being identified. Um, so as money saw it, there were more and more people coming through who were in some way incongruous or contradictory to the category of male and female, to that model that we were just looking at that keeps men, men and women as very separate spheres of activity. So when money's making the time to make this decision, male and female, male and female, is having increasing problems. So what he did was he took not the, he sort of left the biology to one side 
and said, well, we, it's all a bit confusing if you're just looking at people's bodies. We're not able to make this nice, simple decision very easily. So let's just look at the social and psychological elements of, of, of sex or social and psychological expectations for sex. Because actually, there does seem to be a nice hard line between these because it was the 1950s in the United States and it was a very patriarchal time and place. There's a hard, we, know, we know what men are meant to do and what women are meant to do. So all we need to do is find the category that somebody fits in and we can just ignore their body. We can leave it to one side or we can change it later. So, for instance, if a child is there and they have little concern for feminine thrills, doll play or household chores, uh, then they belong in the male category. And if uh, a child has an obsession with hanging laundry, it seems to be very housework focused, their gender role um, category. So um, if, if a child has an obsession with hanging laundry, then they're in the female category, even if, as these were, the top uh, child is a, a girl and the bottom child is a boy. So we can just sort people into their category and then intervene on the body to, to make that not 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 apparent. So this means socially visible following intervention in money's work is the patriarchal model. Everything is ordered back into place. All we can see are masculine men and feminine women living their heterosexual lives. Order restored. So um sorry a bit. Um so, so I think this is if we look at it like this on a kind of conceptual level. Now I don't think that money was doing this on purpose. I think he just accepted and didn't reflect at all on um, patriarchal ideas about sex. He just took them for granted. They're kind of completely unquestioned in his work. But if we think about what's, what's happened here, I found it very useful to think about um, Mary Douglas's work here, who is a anthropologist who wrote um, about the, um, the kind of ways in which different societies approach trying to order things, categorise things, put things into place, and how that's often a response to um, people, objects, or things which somehow disrupt existing order, which are seen as being um, ambiguous in some way, which can't be categorised easily, um, and which are somehow at the margin. So she talks about how Anything which is marginal, um, which kind of exists like like DSD can be seen to do, they exist at this kind of, uh, on this margin between male and female, they're kind of troubling a bit, that kind of hard line. Um, those kinds of people, ideas, objects are often seen as something which there's a lot of social focus on trying to order back into place and kind of trying to categorise or create ways to tidy them away in some way. And Douglas talks about that because we um, tend to not just see things which are disordered in that way, I don't mean disorder like medical way, but which um, kind of trouble the category. We um, often, those are seen imbued with a lot of power and danger socially, and so we create lots of ways to, um, to try and order them back into place to kind of try and tidy things away again. Um, and if we think about this um, this model, the hierarchical male-female model of um, patriarchy, there's been, since money, a lot of threats to this model, um, not at the biological level, which is what money was sort of looking at in his clinic, although he probably he would never have seen it in that way, but women's liberation and gay liberation movements have, have attacked and undermined and questioned the separation of men and women on the social and psychological level um, extensively. And I think it's very, um, yeah, so what that means is that since these movements have come about, um, we're kind of living in a situation where there's this coexistence of patriarchal ideas about sex still exists. We've also got newer egalitarian ideas about how sexes should relate to each other, about what sex means and what it doesn't mean for people and their lives. So we're living in, as Cordelia Fine put it, a half-changed world, a world where these questions of sex are kind of up for debate and are being contested and being moved around. And I think it's very interesting that the two movements that 
um, have most enthusiastically embraced gender and gender identity as a concept are feminism and the LGB um, movement, because it almost seems to me like these are kind of ordering themselves back um, after poking lots of holes in patriarchy in the previous decade. Because gender as a concept really took off most um, in, in the 1990s, so kind of post uh, the second wave and post um, the gay liberation movement. So what does this mean time left, yeah. for um, thinking about gender identity um, as we're seeing it today, um, this kind of political movement? So we can think about what, um, what in, the, in gender identity as a concept and is, is in a political set of political ideas, what is working to conserve that patriarchal model of kind of the hierarchical difference between men and women, masculine men, feminine women, and what is working to maybe disrupt it um, in the way that feminism and gay liberation did. So I think that this has been talked about a lot, but there's certainly ways in which gender identity as an idea and a set of political um, demands uh, conserves patriarchy. So this is because people are, rather than people like money ordering you know, people into male or female categories and deciding that you're masculine, therefore you're a man and we're going to change your body. Instead, now people are doing that themselves. So they are ordering themselves out of the category. So if somebody is masculine, then they might be encouraged to think of themselves as not being a woman in some way. If, if a man is, is, is feminine, they might be encouraged to think of themselves as not a man in some way. So that means that what's left of those um, masculine man, feminine woman categories is just people who fit who fit the expectations, who fit the categories. And then we have lots of people who are maybe ordering themselves completely out of the system. So saying, no, I'm non-binary, I'm not anything to do with this. But again, that kind of patriarchal model is still is still there, is still um, being strengthened. So in one sense, gender identity certainly conserves patriarchy and kind of restores the order and some of the order that has been, I think, disrupted by, by the social changes since the 1960s. But on the other hand, there is some element of um, gender identity uh, culture which disrupts patriarchy as well, which disrupts this model of masculine men, feminine women. And that's because there is lots of ways in which people are being encouraged to be non-conforming to the expectations for their sex. So you have more men around who are doing kind of feminine coded things, wearing feminine coded clothes, and the same with women as well. So people are being encouraged to not necessarily just adhere to the expectations for their sex. And I know, um, so, and this is actually, probably a lot of this goes along with the other influence on gender identity culture, which is um, Judith Butler and the kind of idea of fluidity in gender performance. So I'm not going to go into that in lots of details, but just to point out that this is kind of what, what Butler argued, that people could disrupt gender, or I would say patriarchy, um, by, um, by engaging in, by, by confounding the expectations for their sex, especially in what they're wearing or doing. But I think it's um, very interesting and maybe one of the reasons why this cult, this kind of gender identity is promoting such a lot of very strong and you know diverse um, political responses is because this kind of disruption of patriarchy you can only see that if you don't take seriously the idea that gender identity overrides sex because if you do think that gender identity is the only important thing and that sex doesn't matter at all then all that you can see is the first is is the left hand side because this is what happens if we take gender identity seriously, if we think about this as sex, as then it's men being feminine, women being masculine, and actually there is quite a lot of disruption and subversion going on. So I think probably this second side is what promotes the um, the conservative response to gender identity, and what's on the left side is a lot of what um, provokes the uh, feminist um, objections to the same. Um, 
same set of political aims. I'm going to stop there. Away I'm getting. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Laura. That was brilliant. And um, yeah, really like very informative. And um, it's, yeah, it's, it's certainly given me lots to think about, especially the last slide. Really <laughs> done a process that. Um, <clears throat> so um, we're, I think we're happy to open up um, to questions now. We've got plenty of time. So you kept very well for time. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, as I said earlier, the best way probably to manage questions is um, if you you can raise your hand in teams and it will pop up and then I can kind of go to each person in turn um, to ask questions. We have a Q&A function as well. Um, so do feel free to, to type a question in there if you if you rather prefer to do it that way. Um, I, either is is fine. Um, We'll just give people a minute to sort of have a think if they've got any questions that they'd like to, to put to Laura. Um. <clears throat> I've got a stunned silence at the moment. Okay, right. Jessica, can you unmute? Yes. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. That was so interesting. Um, I learned a lot from it, not being a psychologist. Um, so it's, you know, it, what's quite interesting about this is the kind of narrow funnels of particular disciplinary histories, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of <clears throat> very particular, I think, and it's really important to do that kind of careful unpicking work. Um, and what it made me think about was the um this sort of uh really quite um disturbing severance of mind and body that's going on mm. um increasingly i think since uh you know the 20th century um and i'm just wondering you know as if someone could develop an identity completely separate from from their body their sex body mm. or even their body i mean I just just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, um, in general or in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, you're right. It's really central to the the whole story. I think, and I think in in that original context of money, it was because well, he saw a problem with body, so he was looking elsewhere. But then it's kind of means I think that mind body split is maintained all the way through and probably one of the reasons why gender identity is so prevalent now is because of the internet because this is a a context where you can not have a body or you can have the illusion of not having a body so therefore this the kind of issues with just talking about your kind of social and psychological kind of elements of your self don't I think don't become as apparent and it's really since since genderism moved off the internet into the world that it's kind of come up against successive like material problems of yes but you know actually you still need to get a prostate exam or you still need to you know actually you can't <coughs> can't override your material body in such a simple way as you can on the internet and in that original DSD context I think they were so engaged in changing bodies of their patients anyway that it didn't really didn't really figure because I mean they did so much surgery and hormone treatment and all sorts without often the patients didn't even know that it was just been done to them as children so yeah I think I think you're absolutely right that kind of dualism is really really central and I think in in the feminist use agenda which I didn't really go into as much but um they kind of 
in the second wave they responded to the mind well sort of society body split to try and make the argument that you know the society stuff we can change there is a sex difference but we can change society so that's I think why gender caught on so I mean lots of people said that but that's why gender caught on as a feminist idea because it was a way to make that argument but I think the dualism the mind body split was never really there in m most feminist thought it was more like a tactic that just really caught on to an excessive return I think Okay, um, Rose, um, uh, thank you, that was super interesting. Um, I thought it was, I've not heard that like connection about, Doug, about Douglas made before, and that I thought that was really useful. And what I wonder whether, whether you've got any thoughts about that. So if you've got that final slide you had um, was, I think a really, really useful like way of understanding what's going on and, and informing what's going on now as well and the reactions to gender identity that we're seeing then. Um, I wondered if you think like thinking about like Butler and like if we think about Butler as like doing something disordering, what has what that it feels to me like there's still a pull. There's like there's something pulling that disordering back into the order, like back into the patriarchal order. And uh, that feels like a very strong pull. And because of that, the potentiality of that disordering to disrupt patriarchy, there's a confusion going on about like, if we disrupt it in this way, are we always, like, are people not noticing, I think, that it's being pulled back into the order. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you might have something to say about that and about like where that pull is coming from and what that's about. Yeah, so I think you're exactly right that it's kind of that um well that's exactly what douglas would predict is that if that kind of attempts to disrupt something would would result in attempts to order it and i think you're right that um gone away gender identity kind of is doing both of them at the same time which is why it's so powerful as an idea because people who want to do both can latch onto it but also if you're Maybe this is too psychological, but if you're, you know, it also kind of is safe as well, because the thing is that throwing everything up in the air is like really, so it feels socially unsafe, it's kind of disruptive, which is why you get backlashes and why you get these attempts to kind of get things back to safety again. So I think, um, yeah, so I think the problem with Butler's approach in her really is that she was she had this idea of marginality promoting being disruptive and subversive and I think that's true I think that was right but she disconnected it from the political and from the material so she so she thought that if you pushed at the margins of, of gender or as kind of social expectations for sex then you could get rid of sex completely I don't I don't think that's true and I think if you don't accept the kind of reality of sex and try to build an egalitarian settlement from there, then you're just going to end up in this loop again and again because you just keep coming back to the kind of material reality, materiality that's there anyway. So I think that she was kind of half right, but it's not really. I don't think that if you just if you just disrupt and kind of reorder things within the existing so it's basically reordering what's already there rather than trying to create something new i think that's the difference because i do think it's it's really notable like how how many new categories there are and this kind of and it seems to happen at these junctures at these around these concepts which might disrupt something then you suddenly get all of these new categories When, sorry, Laura. When you say new categories, how do you how do you mean? So I mean, like, you know, the millions of gender identities that you get that exist on now. You know, so that's, you're, and that's very very different to John Money's kind of context, yeah. where it was just two rigid categories, 
that were kind of linked to male and female and it was yeah. just very strict yeah so what's happening I think you get this like we're going to be marginal we're going to be non bi we're going to explode the categories of masculinity and femininity but then there's a kind of pull back as Rose said to but we need to we need to we still need order we still need things to be ordered and categorized so we're just going to create more and more and more gender identity categories and and that's the kind of way of pulling back from the disruption from the from the kind of what's what's being disrupted rather than actually forming to something new because you're just then reordering where somebody is within the existing category you're just saying I'm here I'm here I'm here you're not actually saying let's just get rid of these ideas completely yeah and there's I mean there's sort of an irony almost about people saying oh I'm going to define myself as sitting outside those two categories <laughs> but you are still emphasizing those two categories yeah and you're still talking about in relation to those categories so you're yeah. still defining as it's just a kind of ever increasing kind of micro sets of categories in order within the same system I think okay um Joe, do you like to ask your question hi Laura thank you so much um really illuminating and, and fascinating as ever. Um, I was thinking about, as I'm listening to your speak, uh, Bev Jackson, who was a speaker who's, um, you know, uh, noted to be part of the gay liberation movement in the UK and what have you. And she was drawing this, this tension between people within the pride movement and the liberation movement who were assimilationists, mm -hmm. who wanted kind of be accepted as who they were and, and ultimately left alone and perhaps a contingent as well within that movement who were more liberationists mm. and she talked about how maybe after section 28 was dissolved and we had marriage equality to some degree the assimilationists kind of left the movement and the people who were left were the liberationists and I think I think I recognize some of that in in politics and in discourse particularly in the media and what I'm thinking about is how can psychology perhaps help to calm some of those tensions if such a, a tension does exist how can what research do we need to be doing and how can we be how can we be helping to resolve that kind of animosity which I think we can all recognize so you mean animosity between liberationists and assimilationists yeah, so I'm yeah. sounding really convoluted there. No, so no. There is this kind of um, within gender ideology, particularly, you know, there is this really tense, vicious diametric between which end of a pole you're at. Mm. How can we kind of try and reduce that tension? I mean, that's the the, the question. I know that's the, the million dollar question, isn't it? I don't I don't know how we can, um, but. <laughs> I mean, in terms of, you know, liberation and assimilation, you know, people are allowed to have different political aims and I don't, you know, I'm not interested in telling people what to do. Um, so, you know, I think there were always going to be those, there's, uh, whenever there's been a movement, it's made a big social change, there's always going to be kind of different factions and that um, kind of thing. But I do, I don't know, in terms of like taking the heat out of the, the political debate, the political tension. I, you know, I think people need to accept that other people have different thoughts yeah. to them. I think that's the that's the fundamental thing. I don't I don't think it's very theoretical. It's um and maybe in terms of psychology, maybe we need to be a bit aware of kind of the. I think a lot of stuff is being done to make people. So the people feel safe and the kind of managing threat and I don't mean physical threat but the kind of like psychological threat and that makes people quite un like intolerant of disagreement yeah. and dispute so I think there are some psychological elements in in there but I don't I don't think the solution is psychological I think the solution is just that we need to calm have a calm political kind of space where people are allowed to disagree and again the internet has kind of disrupted that but we need to kind of try and maintain it I suppose even even listening to my own question back it kind of sounds like I've got 
normative assumptions within that and which wasn't my intention and, and that's the kind of that's the thing that is so difficult to talk about these things without sounding that you're assuming some kind of positionality um but thank you anyway yeah. Laura. cheers it's a really good question Joe. i think um yeah yeah that's very interesting i think um yeah i think some of it is on terminology even at the beginning you know the first slide where you were talking about language and what does the word gender mean and the origins of the word gender that's quite interesting because actually people people's interpretation of individual words and phrases and the context of those i think is a huge part of kind of animosity within conversations around gender and people feeling that they're being miscast or mischaracterized is a massive part of it both sides of you know the discussion or the, the many facets of the discussion i think if if yeah language is it's actually really unhelpful at times you know and the fact that sex is a noun and a verb and there's people kind of not wanting to use it for certain reasons and then you move away to a different word that has different ambiguities or different associations and it's different to different people um yeah I mean I, like I've sometimes wondered if there's if we could learn from um other societies with different languages where the words are different and they may or may not have those issues because the language operates completely differently but yeah I mean I think Money said that he wanted to one of the reasons he created gender role was to relieve the terrible strain we put on sex as a word so saying it means too many things at once mm. and I think that we've ended up now with exactly the same problem with gender it means too many things yeah. and it kind of tries to contain too much but I don't think we should try and split it again because that's where all of this problem has come from. Clarifying terms when you're talking about something is probably helpful. I, yeah. don't know. I am a biologist or I was. So. <laughs> um, okay. okay do we do we have any more questions because we're just on just after two so that would normally be our kind of wrapping up time um, but if anyone else is just maybe teetering on the edge of the question do feel free okay well that was wonderful thank you again everybody for joining us thank you laura so much for that wonderful presentation um yeah, you are. and um we will look forward to kind of putting it up on the um on the youtube channel so don't forget to search for open university gender critical research network um, for more information about the network and its activities and for um, for videos of this seminar and previous ones. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.